Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Peter Singer about animal suffering, the perception and psychology of eating animals, and utilitarianism and resource distribution. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Spencer. It's good to be talking with you. You too. I think it's really no exaggeration to say that you're one of the most influential living philosophers, and you've actually had a really big impact on me. I first read one of your books in college. I read Animal Liberation, and it really influenced my thinking about animals, and it's very very appropriate for today too, because I understand that you have a, a new edition coming out, Animal Liberation Now. It's almost a new book, really, because uh, it's over 30 years since it was last fully revised. And there's so much changed that uh, about half of the material in the book is new. Oh, wow. Yeah. So let's start there talking about animal liberation and how that field has changed and how treatment of animals has changed. And then we'll get into a whole bunch of other philosophy stuff towards the second half of the, of the recording. But uh, yeah, so, so what has really changed that has caused you to rewrite so much of the book? Well, the book has, as you might remember, um, two descriptive chapters, one on the use of animals in research and the other on factory farming. And because it hadn't been updated since 1990, uh, that was really seriously out of date. So people reading the book would find out what experiments were done on animals in the 1980s, but that's not very relevant today. And in terms of factory farming, there are clearly a lot of things that have also changed. Uh, So those two chapters had to be fully updated. Then Factory farming is also more global now, so I had to take account of uh, what China has been doing, which is not good, I have to say. And China is also a bigger player in uh, research on animals too. Uh, So that's there. It's more global. Climate change has come into decisions about what we eat, and I wanted to bring that in um, and give it quite a bit of space. And then there's just the fact that there's now strong animal movement, and a lot of people ask me, What progress has been made? Have we made progress? Have we gone backwards? So I want to answer that question and highlight some of the positives that have occurred while certainly not downplaying the distance that still needs to be covered for us to be able to look honestly at what we're doing to animals and say, um, well, we've changed and we now give animals their due. We're, We're just very far from that. Right. So one factor is population growth. The more people there are on Earth, the more animals are being eaten and being raised in factory farms, presumably. But if we kind of adjust for population growth, would you say that the treatment of animals has overall gotten better or worse? I think if we're talking about numbers and we're talking globally, you'd have to say it's got worse even allowing for population growth. Because if you look at just China, for example, Yes, their population has grown, of course, since the first edition of the book, 1975. But also China has become uh, more prosperous. And in general, that's a good thing that hundreds of millions of people who were living in poverty in China now have better lives. But uh, those better lives and more disposable income means that they're eating more meat, Uh, whereas meat consumption in affluent countries has been fairly flat or close to it, and in a couple of cases actually has declined. In China, it's just like, you know, one of those hockey stick uh, curves where it just goes up. And uh, so even allowing for population growth, there's a lot more meat being consumed, and China is developing huge factory farms to cater for that demand. Uh, Multi-story skyscraper-like buildings, there's 26-story buildings in China just filled with pigs on every floor to meet the demand for for pig products in China. Now, I imagine a lot of my listeners are familiar with some of the arguments around animal suffering and why factory farmers might be problematic, but maybe you just want to give just a very quick overview of why could this potentially be such a huge issue on a moral level? Well, uh, I see it as an issue that is in some ways parallel to other huge moral issues that we're familiar with, such as racism and sexism. And when you look at those issues, we see that there has been a dominant group, whites for racism and males for sexism. Um, And they have used those who were outside that group for their own 
benefits and purposes, most viciously, of course, in the case of slavery, but also in other ways, in the ways in which men have, have dominated women and given them few options but to do what the men wanted. And along with that domination and abuse has come an ideology which the inner group has used to justify what it's doing. So um, the superiority of whites over uh, those of, of other races, the idea that it's natural for women to be subordinate to men. And I think you know, there's a real pattern here that we, we as humans as a whole do this to other species. We are dominant over them. We have power over them. We use them and exploit them, enslave them, you could say, but you know, certainly we use their, their bodies, eat them, use their products like milk and eggs, uh, and we use them as tools for research or you know, take their furs from them, kill them for that. So there is that clear usage. And there is also an ideology that justifies that. One example is the idea in, in uh, Genesis that God gave us dominion over the animals and the interpretation of this as meaning we can do what we like with animals. And that's been very explicit uh, for many centuries in uh, the Christian tradition. And then there are ideologies about, well, they don't really can't, they don't feel, they can't thought they didn't feel at all. I don't think many people believe that, but we still tend to downplay their feelings and their sensitivities and their social needs, if they're social animals, in order to avoid the cognitive dissonance when we know that we're using them in ways that are causing them to have miserable lives or to suffer extreme pain. And that is certainly the case with factory farming, with the use of animals in research, with a whole lot of other areas that uh, we're making use of animals and killing animals, catching wild animals like, like fish in absolutely vast quantities. So all of that is, I think, a form of speciesism, which is a term that I use to make that analogy with racism and sexism. I can imagine when hearing you talk about that, some people might think that you're advocating not using them as a means to an end. But my understanding of your approach is that you're actually much more focused on the suffering and utility aspects of it rather than sort of, oh, we shouldn't use animals because, you know, they're not ours to control. Do you want to kind of unpack that a little bit, like the perspective you're coming from? Sure. That question goes uh, fairly deeply into my underlying ethics. The idea that we must not use others as a means to our end is a, an idea that comes from Kant, whereas I take my ethics more from the English utilitarian school of Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and the uh, less well-known, but I think more philosophically sharp, uh, Henry Sidgwick. So you're right. For me, what is important is the consequences of our actions and what do those consequences do for the well-being of other sentient creatures. So what do they do in terms of producing pain or pleasure, uh, misery or happiness? And unfortunately, what we do to animals in vast numbers is overwhelmingly to make their lives miserable and often very painful as well. And we do this for purposes that are in no way essential for us, arguably don't benefit us at all, but actually harm us in the long run in terms of our, our health, in terms of the ecology and the climate of our planet. The, the major uses of animals are actually harmful rather than beneficial, but we continue to do it without really giving the interests of the animals the kind of consideration that I believe we should. I think one thing that's easy for people to overlook if they've never looked into this area is just the staggering quantities we're talking about. You know, if we look at how bad the lives of the, many of these animals are in factory farms and we multiply by the number of animals, it's like absolutely mind-blowing the amount of suffering being created. Uh, do you want to say something about its scale? Yes, absolutely. You're right. The scale is, is really difficult to conceive in uh, globally uh, that humans raise and kill something like 200 billion vertebrate animals for food each year. The largest number of those are fish because of the growth of aquaculture and fish are uh, sentient beings and aquaculture is completely unsuited to their needs. But even putting the fish aside, we have something like maybe 85 billion vertebrate land animals raised for food. Chickens are the majority of those. 
The United States alone produces something like 9 billion chickens a year. And just to give one example of, of the kind of, of suffering that occurs, these chickens have been specially bred to grow extremely fast, uh, so fast that in some cases their immature leg bones collapse under them. The birds collapse on the floor, unable to move to food or water. Now, because you have 20 or 30,000 birds in a single shed, there's no individual care for birds at all. And those birds who can no longer walk or move will just uh, die of dehydration or, or starve to death. And then somebody might walk through the shed once a day and, and look for corpses and, and pick them up and throw them out. But that uh, the industry average for birds who die, and, and these, as I said, these birds are very young when they're killed, they're about six to seven weeks old. And 5%, over 5%, one in 20 of them, don't even make it to slaughter. So that's close to half a billion birds who actually suffer to death. They, they don't get taken to slaughter, which is supposedly quicker than collapsing and dying of thirst or, or starvation on the floor. But, you know, that, I think that, that half a billion, if you think of that, it's, it's happening every day uh, on a vast scale. More than a million birds are suffering to death every day in, in the United States under that factory farm system. And that just goes on and on. And most of the people who eat chicken don't, don't even know about it. When I was 18, I had my first reading in utilitarianism and I was reading Bentham and there was a line and I'll paraphrase it. It was something like, the question is not, do animals reason, but do animals suffer? And that just, that line just struck me so hard. And I actually became a vegetarian that day because it just, it, the, the, that idea of like, wait a minute, it, it's not, it doesn't matter how smart they are. It matters what they experience and what, what, the, um, what we're doing to them. And so that, yeah, that, that really resonated with me. And then reading Animal Liberation a few years later kind of really consolidated that view for me. So yeah, so just, it was, it was very impactful in my own life. But when I go about the world and talk to others who are not, sort of not steeped in these ideas, it's just so different than the way people are used to looking at it, right? It's like somehow we go about our lives allowing the suffering to exist all around us and get so normalized that it's just totally normal to go eat another creature and, and not think twice about it. So I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on the psychology of eating animals and sort of how people sort of, uh, you know, at, on the one hand, care about animal suffering, because I think most people actually think it's awful to hurt animals and think, you know, it'd be horrible to kick a dog. It'd be horrible to kick a pig for no reason even. And yet, you know, they go and eat animals every day, which, you know, I think I totally understand that because it's so normal to do. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Just before I talk about the psychology of that, I just want to say, I, I think it's really wonderful that something that Bentham wrote more than 200 years ago is still affecting people, you know, still affected you and you you read it and you decided to stop eating animals. Um, that's a really powerful example of, of what philosophy can do. And it is a powerful statement. I agree. You've, you've, you've got it right. Uh, he's considering the idea that we are more intelligent than animals, that we use language. And he says the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Um, and that is the crucial question, and I repeat that in Animal Liberation. Now, now, what's the psychology of this? As you say, if somebody walked past, uh, you know, somebody who was kicking or hitting a dog in the street, they would be horrified and they would do something to stop this. And we like to think of ourselves as being kind to animals. But the same people who would be horrified by seeing someone hitting a dog in the street are eating cows and pigs and chickens which often suffer much more than a dog being being hit in the street. So what is going on there? I think to some extent there is an ignorance of, for example, the things that I just said about all of these half a billion chickens who suffer to death and, and people don't know about that. But I also think that they don't really want to know about that, so they don't look at it. I've certainly heard people say, people have said to me um, when I and tell them why I'm not eating animals and start to tell them about factory farming. Um, they say things like, oh, don't tell me you'll spoil my dinner, which, you know, when you think about it, is really quite a horrible thing to say, but people say it quite calmly and, and cheerfully as if it's a reasonable thing to say. Um, essentially, it's saying, if you give me this information, I may realize that I'm doing something 
horribly wrong, terribly unethical. And I don't want to know that. I'd rather just go on doing it. I don't generally compare what we do to animals with the Holocaust. But but in this respect, the psychology is a little similar to those Germans who saw the Gestapo taking the Jews, their neighbours perhaps, away and didn't really want to know what was going to happen to them. Because if they did, they maybe would feel that they had to do something to try and, and stop it or protest. And, and that in Nazi Germany would have been extremely dangerous, obviously. They could have got taken in by the Gestapo themselves and imprisoned or, or killed. So in a way, you know, those Germans who turned away from what the Nazis were doing to the Jews actually had a stronger defence for not wanting to know about it than people who say, don't tell me you might spoil my dinner, who aren't going to in any danger at all, except perhaps in the danger of deciding that they need to change what they eat. So that that's part of the psychology not wanting to disrupt your your habits and what you're doing. Uh, another part of it, which has been shown in um, interesting experiments, is that we tend to avoid the cognitive dissonance that we might get by thinking less about the capacities of the animals we eat. And this was demonstrated in an experiment in which psychologists invited students to come in to answer some questions in research. And when the students came in, they were given a whole lot of different questions. But some of the questions were about animals and what they thought of the capacities and intelligence of cows and pigs and other farmed animals. So the students answered that, and, and then they did other tasks for another uh, hour or two. Then they were told that uh, lunch would be served, and they were randomly selected into two groups, one of which was told that they were going to be eating a hamburger, a beef for lunch, and the other was told that they were going to be eating salad and a plant-based meal. But before they sat down to, to eat, they were asked to just go over and refresh some of those answers that they'd given. And the ones who'd been told that they were going to eat beef gave answers, different answers to the questions about the capacities of cows uh, and answers which were in the direction of reducing the intelligence and awareness of cows, whereas the ones who were expecting to eat no meat didn't change their answers in, in that respect. So uh, you know, it, it really showed in quite a neat way that we are uncomfortable with thinking that we're eating intelligent, sensitive beings with a range of emotional needs. And we try to tell ourselves that that isn't the case when we're sharply aware of the fact that we're about to eat them. That's such an interesting study. My experience has been that people, when they dig into this topic, they're, they have this moment where they're, they're sort of, it seems like they're subconscious projecting forward. Wait a minute, if I keep going down this line of thinking, then I might have to give up something that I care about or feel like I'm a bad person or, or feel guilty or something like this. And that the, at that moment, there's sort of like a branching path, right? They can either come up with a rationalization to make themselves feel okay about it, or they can like cause this thing that they see as bad for themselves, like giving up a food they like or feeling guilty or whatever, right? And sort of like, you can see why the mind is like, oh wait, we can protect ourselves by rationalizing. We can protect ourselves by just looking away, right? Yes, that's right. I think that is the easiest ad for some people. <laughs> Obviously, I don't think it's a good ad and I expect that there is still some dissonance that is going on in them, even if they've suppressed it. And I have to say that I, I personally, when you know, I became a vegetarian more than 50 years ago, but I found it satisfying, really, to uh, have my values in harmony with my actions. And um, I enjoyed the switch to different kinds of foods. It, it meant I was in England at the time. I was a graduate student at uh, Oxford. And, you know, it, it really meant switching from British or even more broadly Western European cuisine to exploring the cuisines of other cultures. Uh, India obviously has a huge range of vegetarian dishes. China has quite a few as well. Middle Eastern dishes, a uh, uh, number of vegetarian dishes, everybody knows, uh, falafel, Italian, Mediterranean. Uh, I suppose that uh, that was the one that I had been eating most of before. It wasn't such a bad. But uh, it was really fun exploring those cuisines. And uh, I felt good. It felt uh, a little lighter without the heaviness of, of meat as part of my main meals every day. So I didn't think it was a sacrifice. In fact, the, the biggest difficulty was explaining it to our friends. And, and, and at that time, there were very few vegetarians. So some people, you know, thought that we'd somehow become cranks of some kind. 
but uh, but in terms of the actual change, uh, it was good. I think I really did benefit from it. It's funny, after I became vegetarian, one day I was walking down the street and I'd been having trouble adjusting. I had no idea how to eat vegetarian, so I had no idea what I was doing. And I was struggling and I was feeling hungry and I run into the only vegan that I knew at the time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I ran into you. Like, how do you do it? You know, I feel hungry all the time. He's like, I feel hungry all the time too. And I was like, oh no, I made a terrible mistake. But then it just turned out I was just being an idiot. And I just needed to, you know, get a few basic things right. And I was like, oh, actually it's extremely easy to eat vegetarian if you just kind of like spend a little time reading about it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, I certainly feel good and uh, and don't feel hungry. You were lucky that, well, maybe this vegan was not particularly helpful, but, uh, you know, when I, I didn't know any vegans when I became vegetarian, there were most people, in fact, I didn't understand what the word meant um, until somebody explained it to me who was a vegetarian and said, oh, there are these people who actually don't even eat dairy products or eggs. And there's a society, there was a British vegan society that was surprisingly founded in 1944, but it had, I think, 300 members, something like that. And my guess is that there weren't too many vegans uh, apart from those 300 people in Britain. So yeah, it was really a different world. And now I think it has got a lot easier for people to make that change. And there's a much greater variety of uh, foods on the market. They're, they're sold in every supermarket. When I did decide to dairy milk and, and buy uh, soy milk, I, you had to go to a special health food store to get it. You couldn't find it in any supermarket. That's a very different situation now. Whether you're a marketing manager, a product engineer, a CEO, a researcher, or a social scientist, you sometimes need to know what lots of people think about a thing, or you might want to have people enroll in a study or experiment. But recruiting study participants can be time-consuming, error-prone, and expensive. Well, good news. Positly is here to help. Positly addresses the common pain points that researchers encounter when recruiting study participants. It aims to solve common research problems and dramatically improve the speed, quality, and affordability of human subject research. With Positly, researchers, marketers, and product developers are empowered to produce better results by accessing high-quality participants through an easy-to-use web interface, making it easy to run surveys on thousands of people in mere hours, and it can now be used to recruit people in over 100 different countries. To learn more and to give your research project superpowers, visit Positly.com. That's P-O-S-I-T-L-Y dot com. I think the idea of moral circle is very important here, and I know that's an idea that you talk about. And one thing that brings to mind for me is the way that many human travesties that have been committed have involved putting other humans outside of our moral circle, right? So let's say the enemy tribe is outside the moral circle, so it's okay to kill them. Or, you know, the people over there in that other country are outside the moral circle, they're, and you kill them. And, and, you know, it's the same thing with animals. Like many people will put animals outside that, of that moral circle, but it doesn't have to be just animals. Like humans in history have, have put all kinds of different humans outside their moral circle. And so, yeah, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about the, where the moral circle comes in with uh, animal treatment. Yes, you're right. I, I think it is a continuation of a process that we can see has been going on for a very long time. And that when humans lived as small tribes, I think that the, the general thinking is that we evolved living in, in groups of not more than 150 and people's loyalties and commitments, so their, their social ethics was limited to members of, of that tribe. And that continued, of course, with, with those who were living uh, those kind of lives. That's, that's still continued quite uh, you know, into, into the 20th century. When I was about 18, I went to the highlands of New Guinea and you know, there were people there who would not walk across the ridge of mountains into the next valley because those were different people and their lives might be in danger. So you know, we have then expanded as, as we lived in larger communities as we were able to travel more, as we developed uh, states with some kinds of law and uh, enforcement of that, we expanded our concern to members of our nation or state. We eventually expanded beyond that to uh, the idea of, well, saying the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the mid-20th century, the idea that all humans 
have rights. Uh, and many people thought that once we'd done that, then that was the end of this expanding circle, that, that that was all of the beings who had moral status were now included. But of course, I don't think that's the case. I think that we do need to push that circle wider and include all beings who are capable of feeling pleasure or pain, all beings who are conscious, whose lives can go well or badly from their own subjective point of view. We're not justified in, in leaving them out. Um, they have interests. Their interests, you know, it's just as bad if a cow or a pig or a horse or a dog feels pain as if a human feels a similar amount of pain. Humans certainly have different interests. We have interest in being educated and uh, maybe have interest in listening to philosophical discussions, which uh, animals don't. But, but where our interests are similar, um, like not suffering a, a physical pain, or, but also a, a wider range of interests too, then I think we should expand that moral circle and give equal consideration to the similar interests of all beings who are conscious. It seems to me that the meat industry has a very important role to play in this whole thing. And that in many ways, it makes it easy for people to be in denial about harm they're causing, right? We get these advertisements about these happy cows, you know, eating happy grass, right? Every, every, you know, every message is that like, oh, it's not that bad. And I actually ran a survey asking people, just a general population in the US about their views on animals. And what I found so interesting is how much people actually said they cared about animals, even about farm animals and how wrong they thought it is to hurt farm animals. And yet the place where they diverged from what a vegetarian would say is that they thought that the animals they were eating were probably treated okay, right? So they're like, no, it's not okay to hurt farm animals, but I'm not doing that by my actions. It seems to me that part of that is sort of just propaganda from the, the meat industry uh, and sort of like allowing people to take actions that are in many cases totally out of the line with their own values. Like, I, I think that most people, if they live with the, in line with their own values, they would try to avoid harming animals to a large degree in their lives. Yeah, right. But um, of course, it's true that they're very unlikely to not be harming animals if they're eating meat. And they may have a picture of cows grazing on, on grass, which cows will do, you know, some, some cows will do. So beef cattle are initially raised on grass before being transported very long distance to feedlots uh, where they're not on grass and they're being fattened on grain because that makes them put on weight faster, come to market faster, and also produces that kind of marbling that uh, Americans will pay more for, which is like veins of fat that are running through the meat. So the lives are not good, but the lives of cattle who are at least outside and have a bit more space to walk around are probably in general still significantly better than the lives of the animals who are inside all of their lives, which is 99.8% or something of chickens produced in America are inside. The vast majority of laying hens, uh, hens who lay eggs, are confined inside, and a majority of them are still in very small wire cages uh, where they can't really even stretch their wings fully and they can't escape other birds who they're sharing that cage with who might be more aggressive. And pigs too are um, inside all their lives typically. And there are a lot of kinds of, of suffering that go on there that people don't ever even think about. For example, with both the pigs and the chickens, as I said, the, the, they've been bred to grow extremely quickly. And to do that, they've been bred to have huge appetites um, and to put on weight very fast. Now, that's their genetics. Now, think, how do those animals come into existence? Well, they have to have parents with the same genetics. But the parents have to live longer than the chickens and pigs who people eat because they have to be sexually mature. And the, the pigs and chickens are slaughtered when they're young and not sexually mature. So you have these animals with huge appetites, wanting to eat very fast. Uh, wanting to eat a lot and, will, and, and grow very fast. But they have to live long enough to be able to reproduce. And if they did eat what they want to eat, they would get so obese that many of them would, would die. Many of the chickens, for example, would collapse from, from heart attacks. And they might not be able to mate either. They would be so obese that they might not be able to actually. So the solution to this for the industrial agriculture is essentially to starve these animals to um, 
feed them, for example, there's a standard thing called the skip a day feeding pattern, which basically means you feed these chickens you've bred to have huge appetites uh, only every second day. You starve them one day out of out of two. And, and that, that causes other problems. You can read this in the farm journals. They say, well, sometimes then these chickens will drink too much and, and that can be, can be bad for them because they're, they're hungry and they can't get food. So they're just taking in a lot of water. What do you do then? Well, you turn off the water. So then they're hungry as well as thirsty because your only real objective is to get them to be able to, to live long enough to reproduce. And, and the same is true for the sows in particular. The, the breeding sows will be also kept on, on rations that are far less than they would like to eat. So there's all these kinds of, of suffering that go on that are standard and that those who work in this industry know about, but that the public is completely ignorant of. So crazy to think that if there was a murder factory in your town and you just knew it was there, you know, people were being ground up into grinders, you know, people would be up in arms. We'd be, you know, like we, we wouldn't let that happen. And yet we've created this sort of murder factory, this suffering machine that just is all around us. And uh, we kind of just live our lives normally. Yeah, that's right. Now, it, it's interesting that, you know, there are some states in the United States where citizens can uh, initiate referenda. California is an example. And when animal advocates have put some of these forms of close confinement of animals on the ballot, and therefore have had the chance to inform the public about it because it's something that is coming up at uh, election time, they win. Um, you know, the, in California, the ballots to give farmed animals more space. There was one when Obama was first elected president in 2008. It got more votes than Obama did in California. Um, and of course, you know, California is a very strongly Democrat state. And uh, I think it's, uh, Obama got 60 something percent, but uh, the referendum on giving animals more space got uh, even more. And in Massachusetts recently, one got 78 percent. So if you can get this before Americans and really explain to them what's going on, they will vote against it. But, you know, it's, it's only about half or less than half of the states of the US where you can do that. And when it comes to other methods of politics, especially at the federal level, the agribusiness lobby is so powerful that you can't get changes through for uh, farmed animals. And of course, in the states where factory farming is really big, like Iowa, Nebraska, North Carolina, you can't get anything through their state congresses either. The uh, agribusiness lobby is just uh, in complete control there. The way I approach eating in my own life is I, right now what I do is when I eat out, I'm vegan and at home I'm vegetarian, but the animal products I source, I try to source them from more humane sources, which is, you know, not perfect, but for me, that seems to be a pretty good balance. And I'm wondering for people who don't want to go vegan, what are some small changes that they can make that don't affect their life too much that make a big difference to the animals where there's a lot of, there's really low hanging fruit in terms of reducing suffering? I think one kind of, of low hanging fruit <laughs> that isn't a fruit, of course, is to try to get eggs from hens who are really allowed to range freely. And that's possible, although it's not as easy in the United States as it is, say, here where I am speaking to you now in Australia, because um, in Australia we have eggs uh, sold in supermarkets, sorted into three categories, uh, and they're labelled appropriately, caged eggs, uh, what are called barn-laid eggs, so they're indoors but not caged, and free-range. And free range, they have to be outside the majority of the day or have access to outside. And there are limits on the stocking densities, how many birds you can have per hectare. But in fact, the, the free range egg producers compete to have fewer hens per hectare. So I can walk into a store near me and there are eggs for sale where it says 200 hens per hectare. Now, a hectare is two and a half acres. So, uh, you know, that's plenty of space. Um, they would be allowed to have. Uh, I think it counts free range, they would be allowed to have up to 10,000 hens per hectare, which I, I wouldn't think is a good situation. But, but you know, if you're buying those that have some hundreds of hens per hectare, I think the hens have good lives while they're alive. Now, once their rate of lay drops off, they will get killed. So they will have shorter lives than they would naturally. The males of the egg laying breeds killed instantly as soon as they're sexed. Although there is some work going on to, to try and actually detect sex 
during the, the if you like the fetal stage when when the chick is still in the egg and even there's other work to try to get hens to lay only female eggs that seems to be possible too so maybe they'll solve the problem of the of the chicks being the male chicks being killed but i don't think they'll solve the problem of the hens being killed when their rate of lay drops off so it's still you know not ideal but i think you could say look the hens get a decent life and you know i don't want to be completely vegan so i'll have some eggs to eat that's that's one of the kind of low hanging fruit there are a, there's a, a tiny number of, of dairies that don't separate the calves from their mothers because the, that's the standard thing it's another thing people don't know by the way that um if you buy dairy products uh, then you are buying products made from the milk of a mother whose calf has been taken from her within hours of being born and uh, the bond between uh, uh, a cow and her calf is very strong the cow will call for the calf uh, often you know will that 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 may go on for days even for weeks some farmers have said when a cow passes the place where the calf was taken away they stop and look around and and call for the calf so you know it's it's really pretty heartbreaking when you think that uh, milk involves that separation and and the calf uh, the male calves will probably be uh, raised for veal or they may be killed at an early age um the females may be taken away and brought up as as dairy cows but as i was saying um i have just just a tiny number of of dairies that keep the cows with their mothers and uh, only take the surplus milk but um i believe it, that I, there was one in in new england somewhere um then i read that it closed so i'm not sure if there still is there so you know that's actually probably not realistic and of course the milk is significantly more expensive so but i think you know the alternatives to dairy products are now are now very good and i don't think uh, you really need we certainly don't need dairy milk um i guess the the vegan cheeses are not that good yet but they're improving all the time and i'm hopeful actually that we're getting getting um cellular milk in other words milk produced from the cells of milk that are grown so that the, there's no cow involved and and if that happens and is economically competitive with dairy milk it could really put the entire dairy business uh, out of business which would be a very good thing not only for animal suffering but for reducing greenhouse gases as well because cows are major emitters of methane so that is a future possibility though it's it's not on the market yet otherwise you know it's funny some people say to me um when i talk about being vegetarian they say oh i've 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 stopped eating red meat but i still eat chicken uh, or and i eat fish and actually i think from an animal suffering point of view that's worse they should go back to eating cows because cows are much bigger they're rather you know much more valuable animals so they're not going to be treated as badly as chickens and fish will be treated and you know when you eat the chickens and fish there's many more of them that it takes to satisfy you to provide you with those meals than uh, they takes as a cow so i think if you, you know, if you switch from eating beef to eating chickens and fish uh you're actually causing more harm to animals than if you'd stayed with the cows so you may be causing less harm to the climate Yeah, I remember a number of years ago, Julia Galef did an analysis of calories per life, and milk had the most calories per life, about 17 million. So you were causing the least death uh, for, by drinking milk, uh, with cheese second, and beef after that. And then the worst was broiler chickens and then uh, eggs from laying hens. But uh, broiler chickens were by far the worst among the group. Yes, and, and of course that's per life. but um i would be interested in uh, you know if we can quantify su- suffering how much pain what the quality of those lives were as well and that would still make um probably broiler chickens the worst and it would make eggs from caged hens uh, around the worst as well um but i think it would make fish particularly carnivorous fish raised in aquaculture or uh, factory fish farms because there you have not only the suffering of the fish let's say we're talking about salmon you don't only have the suffering of the salmon who is trapped in a net and salmon of course famously have instincts to swim across the oceans and and back again to breed so they're trapped in a uh, in a net and they're swimming in circles around the net they're also often suffering from sea lice because they're very crowded which um would be an, an irritating painful condition for them 
But in addition, because they're carnivorous fish, they have to be fed other fish or fish pellets. And to provide that, the trawlers are going out into the oceans and scooping up vast quantities of low value fish that humans don't want to eat directly. And those fish are dying painful deaths because there's no humane slaughter for, for those fish. They're suffocating to death typically, or they're being crushed to death because they're hauled up in huge nets with thousands and thousands of other fish uh, on top of them. And then they're being fed to the salmon. So, so the, the salmon that you buy then is actually responsible for, uh, I think, something like 80 or 90 uh, other fish that died. So uh, if you're talking about the number of deaths you're causing per calorie, the farm salmon is going to be pretty close to being the worst, as well as in terms of the amount of suffering. When it comes to perception of vegetarians and vegans, I think it's fair to say a lot of people will have a negative reaction to, you know, they just sort of get this vibe that they're being judged, right? Like this holier than thou attitude. And I'm just kind of curious how you think about this, because when I meet people that eat animals, I, I really don't hold it against them at all. I don't judge them at all for it. And I think the reason for that is partly because I think that people can contribute to the world in different ways. And while I do think it'd be better if they didn't eat animals, like they might be way more ethical than me in lots of other ways. And I know I'm imperfect. And so I also know that, you know, we're just incredibly mimicking species where we copy each other. And I do that as well in other domains. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm curious sort of how you think about mediators. Does it affect your opinion of them and so on? Well, I, I, I'm not quite as tolerant as you, I would have to say. I do judge them. I may not express that judgment because that's not going to be uh, helpful. But yeah, especially when people clearly know about some of these things that I've been talking about. I mean, I, I meet people who say, oh, I've, I've read your book, um, you know, read Animal Liberation. I think it's horrible what we do to animals, but I just like eating meat. And, you know, sometimes I've been out with people who know, know my views and who will still order chicken and, and eat it. And I really think, what is your problem here, right? It's not so difficult to... Um, avoid eating uh, those products that you know you're causing a lot of suffering. Now, some of them may be very good people in other ways, sure. And they may say, look, you know, my issue is uh, helping refugees or working for people in extreme poverty. Okay, that, yeah, I can, I can still say, well, they're good people. They just have this kind of blind spot. But there's a lot of people who are not doing any of those things either. And uh, I think, in fact, people who do, who are concerned about animals and who are vegetarian or vegan because of that, typically are doing much more for other people as well. Certainly, you know, that's true in, in the effective altruism movement, people I know who are doing a lot for people in extreme poverty, for reducing risks of extinction, some people who have donated a kidney to a stranger. You know, I think that vegetarians and vegans are much more likely to be doing those things than people who are not vegetarians and vegans. A funny coincidence happened last week I knew you were going to come on the podcast this week and I was on YouTube and a, a video popped up that it was recommending to me and it was, a, it was about your philosophy. But the title of the video was something like the most controversial philosopher who says we're all evil or something like this. And I, I, I thought that was really interesting that it was like positioning your philosophy that way because I, you know, I think that is a, a way to interpret your philosophy. But I'm wondering, I imagine that you wouldn't accept that framing of it. So I'm curious how you react to that. I, I wouldn't use the word evil myself, really, partly because it has religious connotations uh, or, or some sort of greater depth that, um, than, you know, I mean, as you said, there are, there are reasons why people don't do these things. Um, we are a conformist species. A lot of people don't want to do something that's different from what their friends and family are doing. They don't want to feel that they'd be judging their friends and family as doing things that are wrong. So I, I don't think they're basically evil. I do think that they're, I don't know, lacking moral backbone, I could say, except, you know, that's a vertebratist thing to say. Is it better to have a backbone than to be an invertebrate? <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I think they're they're lacking the, the resolve and to to take steps to reduce the harm that they're inflicting on the world. So um if you'd said, you know, I, I I'm a philosopher who thinks that we're failing to live it. You know, most people fail to live ethical lives when they could do much better. That would be a better way of putting it than saying that I think most people are evil. Right. Well, the question of like how bad are most people is sort of about where you draw the line, right? Like everyone could 
do better. Everyone could be more ethical. Even the most ethical person could probably find some way <laughs> to be more ethical. And it's like, and I think this is something that bothers people about utilitarianism, this sort of, well, what is enough? It's just sort of an infinite burden. Yeah, that's true. And I don't claim that I'm doing everything that I uh, should be doing. I think I could be doing more in, in various respects, including in particular living more simply and cheaply and using more of my earnings to help people in extreme poverty. So I'm certainly not claiming to be a saint or, or perfect or anything like that. I think I, you know, the question is, what, what is enough? Well, you're right that really to live up to everything that utilitarianism would say we ought to be doing is extremely demanding. But if we know that we're doing a lot better than most people in the community we're living, I think we can take uh, some solace in that and we can say, look, yeah, I'm, I'm not a saint, but um, I'm doing reasonably well when I look around and I compare myself with others. I I don't have to feel bad about myself anyway. I could be better, but I don't have to feel bad about myself. So I, I think that's the kind of comparison that we might make. But I think we should certainly be doing something significant on major questions like our treatment of animals, which is something that we're, you know, most people are involved in every day. If um, they're not vegan, they're in, involved every day in some sort of involvement in the way animals are treated. I think people who are middle class or above in affluent societies should be doing something significant to help people in extreme poverty. Um, and again, you know, just how much that means will depend on how much disposable income you have. I think we should all be concerned and be active about climate change. That's another huge unfolding issue. But that may be being politically active more than trying to get off the grid and um, not uh, emit any fossil fuels at all, which certainly makes life very difficult. Now, I want to ask you more about your philosophy. My understanding is that you used to identify as a preference utilitarian, and now I'm not quite sure of the right word. Is it hedonic utilitarian, classic utilitarian? How would you describe your current views? Well, I consider myself a hedonistic utilitarian is the term I would use, but classical utilitarian is fine because the classical utilitarians, the ones I mentioned earlier, Bentham, Mill and Sidgwick, were all hedonistic utilitarians, or said they were anyway, with John Stuart Mill. There's some things he said which I don't think are compatible with being a hedonistic utilitarian, but, um, but he thought he was. So, yeah, I, I did make this shift, and it was really connected with a even more fundamental shift that I made because early in my career as a philosopher, uh, if you'd asked me, are there objective moral truths, I would have said, no, I don't think that there are. And I held a position that derived from a professor who taught me at Oxford called uh, R.M. Hare. The position was called universal prescriptivism. Uh, so he said moral judgments are prescriptions. That is, they're like imperatives. They're things that we prescribe to ourselves how we should act and to others how they should act but we do it under a constraint that's why they're universal prescriptions constraint of having to universalize and accept these prescriptions even if we are the ones who would be harmed by them rather than benefited and that constraint hair thought means that we end up with a kind of utilitarianism in which we should do what's going to satisfy people's preferences the most because we're putting ourselves in the position of everybody affected by our action or even every animal affected by our action and taking on their preferences and then doing what we would most want to be if we were in that situation. So um, that was a view that I held for quite a while for the first decade or two of, after I graduated. But I, I did always have some doubts about it. That's particularly about, well, why is it that you have to universalize? What's the basis for that if there's no objective truths in morality? Uh, and Hare's answer was, it's part of the meaning of the moral terms. So if I say you ought to do something, the word ought carries this idea that I'm using it in a universal sense. And I'm not, for example, an ego is saying you ought to do this because I'll be better off. Even if it would make you worse off, you still ought to do it. And I didn't think that that idea that this is part of the meaning of moral language got you very far because you could always just say, well, I'll stop using ought and I'll say, do this or do that. And I you know, then essentially 
That's what Hare called an amoralist, um, and Hare admitted that he had no real arguments to persuade the amoralist, except perhaps prudential arguments that amoralists might not have a very good life if they don't act ethically or don't even pretend to be acting ethically. So that was a position I held, and gradually I got persuaded that, in fact, Hare was wrong to deny that there are objective moral truths. And he, he was part of a kind of a wave in moral philosophy in the 50s. Well, actually started early and started with A.J. Hare's book, Language, Truth and Logic, which was published in the 30s. But then it really took hold in English language philosophy in the, in the post-war period, uh, particularly in the 50s. It was sometimes called emotivism was another uh, non-objective sort of moral philosophy at that time. And Hare was part of that general school. And I came to think under the influence of philosophers like uh, Tom Nagel was one of them, and subsequently uh, Derek Parfit when he published his uh, first two volumes of On What Matters, a uh, really major work of moral philosophy. I was persuaded that this was all a mistake and that we can defend the idea of objective truths in ethics. And once I became persuaded of that, then... I was no longer supporting Hare's view and the idea that we get more to moral judgments by universalizing our preferences wasn't necessarily something that I would needed to accept. I could accept a range of other views and I could think about, well, what things are objectively valuable and what things are not objectively valuable. And uh, I reread Sidgwick. Um, I co-authored with a Polish philosopher, Katarzyna de Lazari Radek, um, a book called The Point of View of the Universe which is a phrase from Sidgwick and which in, in some sense resembles Hare's idea of universalizability, but on the basis of there being self-evident objective truths in ethics. And I came to accept that idea and that, that pain is something that is objectively bad. It's objectively bad for pain to be inflicted on any sentient being capable of feeling pain unless there is some justification such as this will cause less pain overall or cause so much pleasure and happiness that it will be outweighed by that. So uh, pain is something objectively bad, pleasure is something objectively good. Uh, we also use terms like happiness and misery to show that we're not just talking about physical pains and pleasures. That, that became the basis of my utilitarianism. I was still a, a utilitarian, but going back more, as you said, to that classical versions of utilitarianism rather than to the uh, more 20th century version that maximize preferences. Have you ever found yourself struggling to remember an interesting takeaway from a podcast you listened to last month? Have you ever considered how much valuable information you've consumed and then forgotten in the past year? We tend to think we've learned something as soon as we've seen it once, but the harsh truth is that we forget pretty much everything unless we use it repeatedly. ThoughtSaver is a free tool that was created to solve this exact problem. Every day, ThoughtSaver emails you a quick flashcard quiz designed to help you remember the things you care about. If you're not sure where to start, ThoughtSaver has some ready-made decks of flashcards across a wide range of topics that can get you started learning many interesting and important concepts or if you've already got ideas in mind, you can dive right in and start making your own decks of cards. To start using this powerful free tool and begin strengthening your recall of important ideas, head to ThoughtSaver.com. If we look at what humans value, it seems that they value a lot more things other than just pleasure and pain or even, you know, generalized versions of those, like well-being, what convinces you or convinces you that those are the only two th things that matter or the only thing that matters? I certainly think that there are other things that matter, but I think they matter instrumentally rather than intrinsically. So I think that justice, and fairness, knowledge, those are good things. But when I ask myself, suppose that someone commits something that is unjust, but in doing so, they prevent uh, some pain or suffering, and there are no other consequences for any conscious beings. So the injustice doesn't, say, set an example that leads more people to be unjust 
it doesn't lead to resentment that somebody says, "Hey, you dealt with me unjustly." I, you know, that's that's bad, and um, I feel humiliated by that, or I feel that you don't consider me, you respect me. Um, if you put aside all of those things um, and, and ask yourself, is just the fact that there is this injustice that's been committed, perhaps it's un, an injustice that nobody even knows about, it, and the consequences of this injustice are that there is less suffering and more happiness in the world, was it wrong to commit that injustice? I can't say that it was. I can't see why you would think that it was unless you were being misled by the idea that normally we want to promote justice because it does lead to better consequences and you're not sufficiently able to separate that normally justice is a good thing idea from the fact that this is a special situation in which you've been told that the injustice has no bad consequences and only good consequences. With that justice example, I find that fairly convincing, but at least from my own perspective, I don't find it convincing for all these different thought experiments. Like, for example, if we imagine one world with 10 utility, but one person has all that utility versus another world where the utility is spread more equally between people, but there's slightly less total utility, right? There's 9.99 units instead of 10. My brain says, oh yeah, it's actually, well, you know, it's better to sacrifice a little bit of utility if you can spread it around rather than just have one being have all the utility. And I think that I'm in the majority on that thought experiment. And most people have that intuition. So yeah, I'm curious with a thought experiment like that, what's your reaction? Well, I think you're also being misled, or most people are, I can't speak for you, because normally spreading resources more equally does produce greater utility. So I'm an egalitarian in that sense. I would like to see more redistribution to those who are worse off, it seems to me, especially when we think about this globally. It seems to me very obvious that when we have 700 million people in the world who are living on less than two, I think it's currently two dollars 15 us per day is the world bank's standard of extreme poverty and then you have other people who are earning over a hundred thousand um, dollars it's pretty obvious that if you took a thousand dollars from the person who's earning a hundred thousand and they now only have ninety nine thousand dollars and you gave it to the person who is living on less than a thousand dollars a year you would make a much bigger improvement in their well-being than you would cause harm to the person who's now only had $99,000 rather than 100. And I think we tend to think about that when you describe these situations about more equal distribution. We tend to think that the more equal distribution will actually make people better off. And the situation in which one person is on 10 and the other people are on zero or something very low uh, is one where we could increase utility by redistributing something from the person who has 10. Uh, so, so the example is a kind of curious one where you're asking people to, to bracket that off and not think about that in terms of resources, but thinking about it in terms of actual experienced happiness. And I think that's pretty difficult to think about. It's, it's, it's even difficult to think about what it would be for somebody to have this very high level of happiness and it not be based on something that could be distributed to somebody else and make them better off. I totally agree that it's very easy to kind of fall for that mistake with that thought experiment. But I think there are ways to concretize it that, at least to me, make me feel the same way. Like, imagine you have to distribute a bunch of electric shocks. Do you give them, you know, does everyone get a small electric shock or does one person, you know, get a huge electric shock? You know, and I think most people's feeling is that like, well, it's actually better to distribute it more equally. And that's even true if like the total amount of electric shock is, is slightly greater in some, you know, they're willing to sacrifice at least a little bit of that, uh, of the utility to, to spread equally. Um, and I do think that when I try to be careful about that experiment, I do think I, I come to the conclusion that I, that I value equality a non-zero amount. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and so I, I wonder, you know, do we just have, have different intuitions here? Or do you think there's an argument that like one's making a mistake to value equality? Um, I think we do have different intuitions. Uh, it's I'm not sure that uh, I would say that you're making a mistake if you differ from me. Um, it's possible that you're not, and you and and I don't think that I can really 
prove my view to you. I think the the kind of example that you just gave there, um, which is a little bit like, you know, sometimes people say, well, you have a choice between a million people having slight headaches or one people, one person being in, in real agony. I think that's, you know, that raises questions about what is the scale in terms of how we compare those different things. Is there uh, now, of course, you know, people who don't think as uh, don't just want to maximize utility or minimize suffering will say, well, there's no number of slight headaches that um, I would trade off. You know, for the, I think I've said this wrongly. Um, they would say there's, yeah, there's, there's no number of slight headaches that could justify leaving one person in agony because you know, they're, they're just somehow qualitatively different. I'm not sure about that. I mean, it's, I think the number has to be very large because I think the scale of the kinds of pains that people have is one in which you can get very far from the neutral point. You know, if you have a, a neutral point where you're not at any headache and then you just move a tiny bit, so yes, you've got a headache, but it's you know very close to being in the neutral point. And then I think the scale goes a long way into the negatives when you're talking about people really being in agony. And I think, incidentally, the negative scale goes further than the positive scale. So I think the difference between being in extreme agony and being at the neutral point is greater than the difference between being at the neutral point and being as happy as any human or blissful or whatever as any human can possibly be. So that's that's part of what's going on there. And then you have to say, well, suppose you know it takes 10 billion slight headaches to count uh, one person suffering extreme agony. Can we really imagine that? I mean, do we do we have the capacity to? Uh, you know, it's a bit like what we're saying with with animals. We can't grasp the fact that there are these nearly ten billion animals actually living, you know, chickens living in horrible conditions. And and can we grasp the fact that there's ten billion slight headaches and estimate whether that is better or worse than one person being in agony? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, th- there's so many biases that kick in when we try to think about these things that make it really difficult. Like scope and sensitivity, like we just can't understand the magnitude of like a thousand people suffering versus 10 people suffering. And, and like, you know, the, our, our minds just really were not built to deal with these kinds of things. But I still, yeah. So just to tell you a little bit of my story. So I identified as Jesus Holtarian when I was younger. And then eventually, I think what started happening for me is I started thinking, you know, why, why do I actually believe in objective moral truth? And I, it came down to the fact that I really felt like some things are objectively morally true and some things are not. And that that was really at the core of my belief was this, just this feeling. But then as I thought about it more, I started thinking, well, wouldn't I feel that way exactly as much if, in fact, all objective moral truth was was something that like an, an evolved mechanism that helped our ancestors survive? In other words, we have these moral intuitions because they're really useful for survival. And that's why they evolved through hundreds of thousands of years. And that's why I have this feeling. And then as I thought about that more, I started thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't have a really strong argument that it's objective, even though it feels so compelling for me internally. So I'm curious how you kind of think about where evolution fits into your perspective. If these moral intuitions did evolve, why would they evolve to sort of match what's objectively true about the world, if that makes sense? Uh, yes, and I think the answer is that they wouldn't uh, necessarily evolve to tell us what's objectively true about the world. And to me, the evolutionary explanation of intuitions tends to discredit them, um, not to confirm them as intuitions that we want to believe and accept. Philosophers call this an evolutionary debunking of um, certain views. Uh, let, 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 Let me give you one example which comes from Jonathan Haidt. He tells a story about an adult brother and sister, if I remember rightly, they're called Mark and Julie. And they're having a holiday t- uh, together in a remote cabin with nobody else around. And they decide, uh, just for fun, that it would, would be interesting if they were to have sex. So uh, Julie is on the contraceptive pill, but just to make sure that uh, there's no pregnancy resulting, uh, Mark uses a condom as well. They have sex, they enjoy it, but they decide that they won't continue and repeat it because interfere with their sibling relationship or something of that sort. So there was simply this one episode which they enjoyed and had no other consequences. 
Now, you tell this story to a group of people, or, or this is what Jonathan Haidt reports, a group of students, and you ask them, was what Julian Mack did wrong? And the majority of them say, yes, it was wrong. And then you ask them, say, why was it wrong? And they experience what Haidt calls moral dumbfounding. They can't really give any reasons why it was wrong. They just have this intuition, yuck, brother and sister, adult brother and sister having sex, yuck. Or sometimes they come up with things that are ruled out by the story, such as, well, they, they might have a child who would be abnormal, but we know that they couldn't have had a child. That was plain. So I think that's a good example of an intuition that ought to be debunked. So the intuition that it's wrong for a brother and sister to have sex in circumstances where there's no harmful consequences and conception can't take place, I think we should reject that intuition, even though, you know, I may actually feel it myself if, you know, that's, 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 if I think about such a situation. Because that's something that I believe evolved because there is a higher chance of abnormalities and it was better for the survival of your offspring if you didn't have sex in this pre-contraceptive age with a sibling. So I think that there are a, a number of intuitions like that that can be debunked, but not all. And this goes back then to the work that uh, Katarzyna de Lazari Radek and I did on Sedgwick in the point of view of the universe, uh, where we discuss these arguments. And we bring them to bear on the problem that Sedgwick called the profoundest problem of, uh, of moral philosophy, which is the conflict between egoism and uh, universal benevolence. So utilitarians universally benevolent in that they want the good of everyone. That's at least the, the, what the theory says they ought to be aiming at. Whereas egoists are interested in promoting their own good. And Sidgwick in his masterwork, The Methods of Ethics, was examining egoism and utilitarianism, as well as a third method, which he calls uh, common sense morality, um, which is a kind of intuitionism. And he, by the end of the book, he thought that he could show that this common sense morality was not a defensible ethical view, that in fact, it was a kind of indirect form of utilitarianism, a bit like what we were saying before, that, that justice is not intrinsically good, but is beneficial because of its good consequences. But Sidgwick was not really able to resolve the opposition between egoism and utilitarianism because he thought that there is a kind of, although he thought that universal benevolence is something that you can argue for as being self-evident, uh, that is the idea that the interests, the similar interests of anybody else uh, should be given equal weight to my own interests. Uh, at the same time, he, he also felt that he couldn't really reject the intuition behind egoism, which is somehow that I have reason to be especially concerned about my interests that I do not have to be concerned about the interests of everybody else. But if we bring the evolutionary story to bear, then I think we can see that the intuition behind egoism does have an evolutionary explanation. That is, beings who care first and foremost about their own interests and then perhaps about the interests of their offspring more likely to survive and more likely to leave offspring who themselves survive and get to reproduce than if they cared equally about the interests of strangers. So I think the intuition that so troubled Sidgwick behind egoism can be debunked as the product of evolution. And that leaves the utilitarian idea or the universal benevolence idea as an intuition that is not to be explained by evolution, and rather is something that we can see, having developed a certain level of reason, we can simply see that there's nothing special about my interests that mean that they should weigh more than the interests of others. And uh, I can take that, that broader point of view, that point of view of the universe, in which I kind of detach myself from my own interests and look down on the interests of all and say, yes, those people are, are capable of suffering just as I am, shouldn't make them suffer, even if there is some benefit to me that is clearly less than their suffering. Before we wrap up, would you be up for doing a quick rapid fire round where I ask you some short but difficult questions and just get your quick response? Sure, I'm happy to do that. 
Fantastic. All right. So first rapid fire question. Do you think that if we were to ever encounter technologically advanced aliens, there's a decent chance they might have also invented utilitarianism? Yes, I do. I think that these basic truths would be reached by any rational beings who were also capable of pain and pleasure. One thing I think is really admirable about you is the way you speak your mind. You, you say what you think is true, even if people get upset, even if people think you're, you know, a monster, but you believe you're doing the right thing. And you, so you say it because it's what you think is good. And I'm wondering, has your view on this changed at all on the, just the pragmatic value of being controversial? Would you kind of have done things differently if you knew how controversial some of yours would be, or would you have done it the same way in retrospect? I think I would have done it the same way. You know, some people have told me that I shouldn't have said some of the more controversial things that I've said because I tend to get more opposition from that and the things that these people then agree with, like my views about animals and my views about global poverty, would have been more widely accepted. But firstly, I'm not really sure whether that's true in fact. And secondly, I think it's important as a philosopher to say what you think is true and not to try to pull away from the consequences of your views. And uh, utilitarianism does have these consequences that uh, shock a lot of people in some circumstances. But I think that it's educational for people to see that these are the implications, but that one doesn't have to shy away from them, that one can bite the bullet and say, yes, that's the way it is, and that's what I believe. Are there examples where you felt you were wrong about the implications of your own belief system, and then now, in retrospect, you would have had come to a different conclusion about what utilitarianism implies? Uh, so I've struggled with the question that Parfit uh, has you know, d discussed and raised about whether it's better to have a larger population of people whose average well-being is lower, but whether there's a total, a greater total amount of well-being in, in the universe because the population is larger. When I first encountered that, which was when I was a graduate student at Oxford because Parfit was giving classes on that in the early 1970s, although he didn't publish on it until much later. I thought that that was wrong. I thought, I, I tried to argue that we should be concerned with the well-being of those who will exist, rather who, who exist or, or will exist in future, rather those who might possibly exist if we choose to bring them into existence or if we change policies so that other people will bring them into existence. But I now think that my early views on that were wrong. Um, Parfit himself wrote a devastating reply to one thing that I wrote, and I don't accept it anymore. But I still find the problem baffling, and I don't have a really clear view on what is the right answer uh, to those questions. Maybe a young philosopher listening will solve that. I have um, so. <laughs> Others have tried. I have, to warn, I have to warn this young philosopher. There are many, many bright people who have tried. <laughs> So imagine that one day there's a super intelligence that could remake the whole universe into the perfect utilitarian universe. I'm wondering what your intuition says about what that looks like. Is that like tiny miniature algorithms that are orgasming at all moments or some giant single mind that's perfectly happy or something else? I, I, I want to say something else, but it's hard to say what it is. I, I do think that it would be a, a world in which there wasn't uh, pain. Um, you know, if the superintelligent could design it so that well-being, happiness was maximized without any pain. Some people say you need to have some contrast to appreciate the good things. But if we assume that the, the superintelligence could design it so that wasn't the case, then that would be good. But would it just be the pleasure of the super uh, orgasms or would the pleasures of enjoying great literature and the company of other people, and for that matter, the pleasure of thinking through philosophical questions and uh, being stimulated to think deeply about big issues. Uh, to me, that's one of the great pleasures of the world, along with those orgasms. So I don't know whether I would really want to, you know, I suppose the superintelligence could quantify and say, no, the, uh, the super orgasms are better than the pleasures of discussing uh, the ultimate nature of the universe. Um, or maybe uh, vice versa. We, the superintelligence would allow us to be discussing these deep questions because the places would be greater. But 
Uh, let's suppose it came out in the, the quantification came out in favor of the super orgasms. Would I just accept that that's the best possible world? Again, if, if I have to bite the bullet on that, I suppose I, I have to say, yes, it would. I, I can't, in that hypothetical case, uh, deny that that would be the best possible world on uh, my hedonistic utilitarian outlook. Well, you certainly a bullet biter. <laughs> Nobody can deny that. Um, what is the most complex organism that you think is probably not conscious? So, and here, of course, by conscious, we mean is able to have experiences yeah. of any type. Yeah. Yeah. Probably there are some invertebrates that are complex, but not able to have experiences. I think at the moment, a reasonable place to draw the line is to say that uh, there are some invertebrates that can feel pain. Uh, octopus is a good example. There's good evidence that lobsters and crabs can feel pain, but there may be some other complex invertebrates that can't. But it's really hard to be sure because it's possible that bees, for example, are conscious. There's, again, complex behavior. They communicate the distance and uh, direction of, of sources of pollen by performing the famous uh, woggle dance. So, uh, yeah, I... I, I I couldn't really name one, but I assume that there is a point at which you still have a certain amount of complexity without consciousness. And, and of course, we, we know, know more about the complexity of plants now. So maybe there are trees uh, that are complex organisms, but not conscious. Uh, wouldn't that be horrifying if it turns out plants were conscious? Oh, my God, what a disaster that would be. Yeah, um, it would be a, a problem, but it, it wouldn't actually be a reason for eating meat because the animals who we would be eating would have consumed far more plants than we would consume if we ate the plants directly. So uh, I don't know. I don't know how much it would change. Okay, just a few more for you. So suppose there was a movement in society to genetically engineer people to suffer less so that you're born with genes that make them happier and feel less pain. Would you be in support of that? Yes. That's an easy one. <laughs> That's a very rapid, rapid answer. <laughs> Do you think in theory that a device could be built that could scan someone's brain and measure how much utility they're experiencing? Even if, you know, even if we'll never have the technology, do you think that could be done in theory? In theory, yes. I mean, how you would verify that this was actually what, was it, what it was doing and that it could detect who was suffering more and who less would be difficult because you know, we don't have that direct experience of the subjective consciousness of others. But possibly one day we could rig up our brain so that we kind of put our own brain on hold and channel in the experiences of someone else. And then we could say, oh, wow, you're much more sensitive to uh, the dentist drilling uh, the nerve in your teeth than I am, for example. So, yeah, it's, it's possible that we could do that. Some people argue that you should be morally uncertain. In other words, you should assign probabilities to different moral theories and, and kind of act in a way that sort of takes into account those probabilities. But it seems like you kind of go all in in utilitarianism. So I'm wondering what you think about moral uncertainty. Oh, I think there are good arguments for saying that um, we should be uncertain about some things and uh, take that into account in our decisions. I am pretty all in about utilitarianism, but it's possible that I could be wrong. And if someone will say to me, look, suppose you're wrong, then what you're doing here is really bad and the, or what you're advocating is, is bad. And that would outweigh the benefits of you being right. I don't really reject those arguments. Um, what's less clear is what, how, how the, the calculations are gonna come out and what kind of balance of the uncertainty plus, plus the degree of confidence I have in my own utilitarianism, what that would lead me to, to do that's different from what I'm doing now. A final question for you. Many people in the effective altruism community are very concerned about risks from AI, and they worry that advanced AI could destroy the world or could cause some really, really bad outcomes. I'm wondering, where do you rank AI in your list of sort of prior world priorities, you know, among things like uh, global health and trying to help animals and so on? Uh, it certainly ranks. Extinction risks in general rank, and AI is one of those extinction risks. Uh, super intelligent AI. But we also have to consider to what extent we can be confident that anything we do now will actually reduce the extinction risk and compare that with other things where we can have high confidence that we're doing good, like reducing the suffering of animals in factory farms or 
assisting people in extreme poverty, or even working on more practical extinction risks where we perhaps have a better idea of what we need to do, like tracking large asteroids or comets that could collide with our planet, considering how we might uh, detect them early enough to build rockets that would collide with them and deflect their path away from us. Those seem to be things that we could start doing now that might help us. I'm not sure that we're close enough to super intelligent artificial general intelligence to really know how to reduce that risk. I think that it's possible that the work that people are doing now might turn out to be irrelevant when we actually get close to it, which is not to say that I'm against people saying, you know, we should be thinking about this issue. We should perhaps be considering whether we should have a, a moratorium on advancing super intelligent AGI, although you know, how we could get that moratorium to stick is another problem. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad that there are some very bright people thinking hard about these issues. I just don't think that this should be an issue that should dominate the effective altruism movement in a way that sometimes it has come close to doing or at least appeared to be doing. I don't think, in fact, it does or has dominated the movement, but it certainly has soaked up a lot of attention in, in the media, and that's given that impression. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. This is such a fun conversation. Thank you very much, Spencer. It's been great talking to you. Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by We Amplify. Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. If you like our show, then we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. To sign up for that newsletter or to find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit podcast.clearerthinking.org. A listener asks, what would make the biggest difference in combating the bystander effect? Whenever I've heard of the bystander effect, it's normally in the context of like physical danger. Like, you know, you're on a boat and the boat is sinking and everyone's just sort of standing around like, what do we do? And no one's taking charge and that kind of thing. But I think this person's also asking about cases like injustice or abuse or things like that, where there are just bystanders. Yeah. You know, if you think about well, why do people not always act when something bad is happening, right? Like, let's say, you know, there's a crisis where someone's hurt and nobody's doing anything, or someone's known to be an abuser and nobody seems to be doing anything about it. And I think there's a, a few different forces going on. You know, one force is that sometimes people look around to others to get their social cues. And this is what they found and at least seem to find in some of the classic studies on this, where if you had actors that were doing nothing, then people would be less likely to, let's say, do something about the smoke coming through under the door because they kind of looked around and said, oh, well, they don't seem to be freaking out, so maybe it's no big deal, right? So we kind of get, look to others for our cues. And, and this suggests that one thing you can do is you can be the one who actually acts. Because if you go and say, hey, there's smoke coming out of the door, what does that mean? Then that can spur others into action. Whereas if you sit there just looking around, not doing anything, maybe others look to you and say, oh, well, they're not doing anything. Maybe, maybe it's fine, right? So that's one piece. Another piece is people worry about social rejection or they worry about uh, retaliation and so on. So, you know, if there's an abuser in a community... Um, it's one thing if the abuser is really low status, but it's another thing if the abuser is high status or even a leader. But then the question is, you know, who's willing to challenge this person or or what can you do? Because this person may be able to retaliate if you if you call them out. And I think there often the best solution is power numbers, right? So maybe the person has high status, but still, if you get a bunch of people together all acting in a coordinated way, you can still fight against them. It's very hard to do it. If you're if you're much lower on the totem pole, it's very hard to do it one on one if they're much higher status in this hierarchy than you. People may side with them and they, they may not believe you, especially if the person's willing to lie, uh, spread rumors about you, try to take you down. But if you can get three other people that were also abused by them and the four of you work together, there's a very high probability that you can depose that person. So I think that's, that's something to think about.